thank you to everyone um, who is here participating as well. My name is Angela Vianney, and as Maria said, I am a pediatric neuropathologist at CHOP in the University of Pennsylvania. And today I'm going to be speaking about CNS malformations. So as mentioned, I have nothing to disclose and we already saw the learning objectives, so I'll skip those for the sake of time. So CNS malformations is a pretty big topic. Um, so we're going to break the talk down into a few different parts. Uh, we'll begin by speaking on disorders of forebrain induction, which includes three different types of holoprosencephaly and agenesis of the corpus callosum. And in the second portion of the talk, we'll switch to talking about malformations of cortical development. So this includes two different types of lysencephaly, heterotopias, and cortical dysplasia with cytomegaly. And then we'll wrap up with some virtual slides. And I'm sure you can appreciate that this is certainly not a, an exhaustive list of all the potential CNS malformations one might encounter. Um, my goal today is just to provide um, a framework um, of a way to think about these, um, a way to sort of compare and contrast these different malformations, understand their etiologies, and um, sort of to provide a guide for how one might approach these if uh, you encounter, encounter a CNS malformation in your clinical practice. So let's get to it. So what is a malformation? Well, it's a primary disturbance of embryonic and fetal development. And it's important to distinguish these from disruptions and deformations where are due things that are caused by secondary compromises of development. And in the talk today, you'll hear me say, oh, this gene is associated with this uh, malformation or perhaps this teratogen with this one. But the truth is most of these are um, really due to a combination of factors, both genetic, epigenetic, and environmental factors, all kind of combining to produce a certain phenotype. And that's what this um, figure is trying to get at. We have our genetic and our non-genetic etiologies, which can combine in some way to alter gene expression or function. And when that happens, you can get changes in a variety of things, such as cell shape, the way the cells migrate, the way they proliferate and die, and the way they differentiate. And problems with one or more of these could potentially cause a faulty morphogenesis resulting in a malformation. Now, there are a variety of genes that are very important for neurodevelopment, um, and this gets well outside um, the scope of this talk. But here's just a few of them, and we'll be touching on some of these, um, and this is certainly a complicated field. So let's begin with the disorders of forebrain induction. And again, this um, encompasses holoprosencephalies and agenesis of the corpus callosum. So we'll start with holoprosencephaly. So this is a developmental defect of the forebrain, also known as the prosencephalon, which includes the telencephalon and diencephalon. So it results from an incomplete separation of the cerebral hemispheres into distinct right and left halves. Most of these cases are sporadic, though there are occasional familial cases which have been described. Now this is actually fairly common. Um, you can find it, the prevalence is one in every 16,000 live births. But if you look at conceptuses, it's actually much more um, frequent, one in every 250. Now holoprosencephaly actually represents sort of a phenotypic spectrum um, from the most severe forms to uh, the more mild forms. But for the purposes of describing and classifying a, um, holoprosencephaly, it's been proposed that it can be divided into these three types. And I'll be showing you examples of each. Um, so the first form or first type in the most severe is called a lobar or complete holoprosencephaly. And that's where you get no separation of the cerebral hemispheres. It's, um, you have just a holosphere, it's called. Um, there's a single ventricle or a monoventricle, monoventricle, and the brain is very small. The sort of intermediate form is called simulobar or incomplete holoprosencephaly. And that's where the portions of the brain are fused or the, the hemispheres are fused. You get some degree of separation, which tends to occur in the more posterior aspects of the brain. And then the most mild form is called lobar holoprosencephaly, which is where you get a focal fusion along the midline. It's typically along the orbital surface of the brain or um, right above the corpus callosum at, uh, where, at the cingulate gyri. But you can still have other brain abnormalities, even in this mild form, including uh, ventricular abnormalities, as we will see. So let's start um, by looking at the most severe form, which is the alobar holoprosencephaly. So this is a brain that's actually being viewed from the bottom. We're looking up at it. We have the cerebellum here in the back and the brainstem coming up. And this is halfway well preserved, but then we can see this very, very small forebrain here. And there's no, inter no interhemispheric fissure. There's no division of the brain into left and right halves here. We're also missing the olfactory structures. 
here's another brain that's being viewed from that same angle, sort of from the bottom up. So here's the brainstem coming up and here's this holosphere. Again, no separation into left and right hemispheres. Um, this third example here is a brain where we're viewing it from the posterior aspect. So here the cerebellum sort of being pull, pushed down and the holosphere lifted up and we're looking into this monoventricle. Now, this are some coronal sections of a brain of two different brains with a lobar holoprosencephaly. So here for this first one, if we follow the cortical ribbon around here, we can see that there really isn't any true interhemispheric fissure. There's complete um, continuation here across the midline. We have no corpus callosum, and even the deep gray nuclei down here are also fused. And over here on the right, we have um, a fetal brain at about 20 weeks gestation. And if we follow again, sort of the cortical um, plate around here, we can see no separation into left and right halves. The brain would normally divide by about eight weeks gestation. Um, and we also have fusion of the thalami here as well. Now the intermediate form again is called semi-lobar holoprosencephaly where you have fusion um, uh, across the midline, but some degree of separation that tends to occur in the more posterior aspects of the brain. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. This is a brain that's being viewed from the posterior aspect. So these are the occipital poles back here. And here over the vertex, we can see that there is really no interhemispheric fissure. It's continuous across the midline. But as we move posteriorly, we see some degree of separation here into left and right. And coronal sections from a brain with semi-lobar holoprosencephaly might look like this. Um, so this is a more anterior um, coronal section of the brain. So again, if we sort of follow the cortex around here, it dips down, but there's an incomplete separation right here. And we have this monoventricle. But a more posterior um, section, we can see this distinct left and right halves to the hemispheres. Now, the more mild form is called lobar holoprosencephaly. And again, that's where you get most, mostly um, separation of the, the cerebral hemispheres into left and right with focal fusion that tends to occur um, either on the orbital surface or at, this, uh, at the cingulate gyri. And so here's a brain where we can sort of see, we're starting to appreciate maybe some distinction between left and right, but there still appears to be a little bit of abnormalities here along the midline, maybe some fusion. And if you look at a coronal section, even though we have an interhemispheric fissure that looks like it's trying to um, you know, be present here, if you follow the cortical ribbon around, we can see it's continuous. So there's an incomplete separation here. We have fusion at the level of the cingulate gyri. And here's another example of that same thing. If you follow the cortical ribbon around, you can see it's continuous here. And um, here are some of those ventricular abnormalities, the sort of T or Y shaped ventricles that you can see in uh, lobar holoprosencephaly. Now, in addition to the brain abnormalities, um, there are a lot of um, facial uh, anomalies that are also seen in the setting of holoprosencephaly. You can get cleft lip and palate, eye anomalies, which include cyclopia. Um, as we saw in some of the cases, the olfactory structures are missing, so patients can have anosmia where they can't smell, and other um, abnormalities of the nose. You can have a single central maxillary incisor, pituitary dysfunction, and then clinically suffer from seizures and hypotonia. And here's just an example of a um, fetal autopsy that's demonstrating cyclopia here. And this um, was an infant with a cleft lip and palate. And it was proposed um, at one point that sort of the, the face would predict the brain in the sense that the more severe the facial anomalies, the more severe form of holoprosencephaly you would expect to find. And while there is some correlation between that, um, it doesn't always track that way with the most severe facial anomalies being seen only in the setting of say, um, a lobar holoprosencephaly. Now, what's the etiology of holoprosencephaly? Well, there's a variety of things that have been implicated, including maternal diabetes mellitus, infections, uh, congenital infections like toxo, syphilis, and rubella, various teratogens, including ethanol, retinoic acid, and cholesterol synthesis inhibitors. But by far the most common cause are genetic factors um, with cytogenetic abnormalities being seen in about half of all cases. Now, most common is trisomy 13. And if you look at all trisomy 13 cases, about 70% of them um, will have holoprosencephaly. You can also see holoprosencephaly in trisomy 18 just a bit less frequently than in trisomy 13. There's also an association with Smith-Lemley-Opitz syndrome, uh, which is due to mutations of um, 
uh, 70-hydroxy cholesterol reductase, um, which is important in cholesterol metabolism. So um, some connection here um, also with uh, the teratogens. And then there's a variety of mutations that have been described. So um, here's a table from Greenfields, and this is not an exhaustive list of all the genes that have been associated with holoprose encephaly. There are others, um, but some of the, the big ones to point out here are things like Sonic Hedgehog and its receptor, UTCH1, uh, important for forebrain patterning, patterning and also zinc finger um, as well, which is also important for um, forebrain development. So these are certainly less common than say the, um, the you know, the cases caused by tris trisomy 13, but just know that there's been a variety of um, mutations that have also been implicated. So that was holoprosencephaly. Let's move on now to discussing agenesis of the corpus callosum. So just like holoprosencephaly, um, this is sort of a phenotypic spectrum where you can have total agenesis, sometimes referred to as complete, or partial or incomplete um, agenesis of the corpus callosum. And in the partial type, typically it's the more posterior portion of the corpus callosum that's missing the splenium. So the majority of cases um, where you see agenesis of the corpus callosum, there are other malformations um, in the CNS. Uh, we saw examples already in the setting of holoprosencephaly where there is agenesis of the corpus callosum. But in some cases, you can just get isolated um, agenesis of the corpus callosum without other um, real CNS at malformations. In these cases, um, the clinical presentation can be quite subtle. Agenesis of the corpus callosum can be sporadic, um, but it's also associated with syndromes like Icardi, Andermann, and Meckel. And there's been several um, possible pathogenic mechanisms which have been proposed. One of them um, is that you may have a misdirection of fibers that would normally go into forming the corpus callosum. And the evidence for that is the presence of the props bundle, which I'll show you on the next slide. And also um, mechanical um, obstructions have been shown to cause agenesis of the corpus callosum. For example, things like hamartomas and lipomas that are sitting along the midline. And I'll show you an example of that as well. So here we're looking at a brain that's viewed sort of, it's been cut sagittally. So we're looking at the right hemisphere here. This is the right ventricle and above it, the corpus callosum. So this is normal. And then above that, we have the cingulate gyrus here. Now in a brain with um, agenesis of the corpus callosum, we can see here that we are missing the corpus callosum. And in addition to that, you get an abnormal gyral pattern here. You have these radiating gyri that are coming out like this and uh, no normal um, appearance to what would be the cingulate gyrus. And this can be something that's very helpful, say, especially if you are doing pediatric um, uh, brain autopsies. Sometimes the corpus callosum can be very thin and fragile. It can be artifactually torn or disrupted. And so if you're suspecting agenesis of the corpus callosum, looking for this sort of abnormal gyral pattern is, is uh, very helpful. Now on coronal sections, um, you can see sometimes what's called this bat wing appearance or shape to the lateral ventricles. And then within the lateral ventricles, we have these bundles of axons called the props bundle. And once again, these are thought to represent misdirected closal fibers. So fibers that should have gone across the midline to form the corpus callosum, for some reason, um, didn't go the way they were supposed to, and they form these props bundles. There are animal studies that support this hypothesis, and also um, the fibers in the props bundles tend to myelinate around the same time as the corpus callosum would. Over here, we have an example of a mechanical obstruction. This is a lipoma sitting here. And here would be the fibers that are trying to form the corpus callosum, but they're unable to make their connections across midline due to this obstruction. So that was the first part of the talk, the disorders of forebrain induction. For the second part, I'm going to transition to talking about malformations of cortical development. And this includes uh, type 1 and type 2 lysencephaly, uh, various heterotopias, and cortical dysplasia with cytomegaly, at least what we'll be uh, covering today. There are certainly other uh, malformations of cortical development. And this is a really large group of very diverse disorders, and it kind of combines descriptive morphology and genetics. And it's important to point out that a certain phenotype could result from several different genetic or non-genetic causes while a given mutation could potentially result in multiple different phenotypes. And we'll uh, try and show examples of this. Before we get to that, just need to spend one slide on development of the cerebral cortex. And this is certainly not my area of research. Um, I think I have a fairly 
you know, basic understanding of it. Um, but I think it is important to have that basic understanding because there's a lot of really important steps um, that go into developing a normal cortex. And if you disrupt one or more of them, it can result in a certain phenotype. And so I just want to spend a quick moment um, just reviewing that. So this is a schematic showing the embryonic forebrain and the cortical neuroepithelium is shown in green. This would give rise to our excitatory neurons will populate cortex. And as they mature, they have to migrate out here radially, these little green arrows. We also have the medial and lateral ganglionic eminences shown in red and orange. And when we're talking about cortical um, development, uh, the ganglionic eminences will give rise to inhibitory interneurons, which have to sort of migrate around here first and then uh, reach their appropriate location and then migrate out um, radially as well. If we zoom in on this area here, looking at the developing cortex, down in the ventricular zone, we have our progenitor cells and also the bodies of the radial glial cells. Um, these cells extend a process up to the surface of the brain and are thought to sort of provide a scaffolding along which migrating neurons can, can use. Um, so the, um, the neural precursors begin to sort of differentiate and mature and they move into the subventricular zone and to the intermediate zone and then eventually out into the cortical plate. And if we sort of look going from early to late here, um, the first neurons to migrate will actually populate the deeper layers of cortex, and the last neurons to migrate will populate the more superficial layers of cortex. So there's a lot of really important steps that need to happen. We need to have um, neurons that begin to um, differentiate um, appropriately. Um, they need to begin migrating. They need to stop migrating where they're supposed to. And so any um, disruption to these uh, steps um, can potentially result in a malformation. And that's why I really like this table because it sort of breaks it down by developmental stage and what type of malformation you can get if that stage is disrupted. So if you have abnormal neuronogenesis, you could get things like focal cortical dysplasias. If the neurons don't migrate appropriately, you can get various types of heterotopias or type one list encephaly. If the neurons start migrating but don't stop where they're supposed to, you can get cobblestone or type two list encephaly. And we'll be going over actually um, the majority of the genes in this table as well. So I think this is just a nice way to kind of think about um, cortical development and um, how uh, alterations in each one of the steps can potentially result in a malformation. So let's begin with type one list encephaly. Now list encephaly is a neuronal migration disorder and it's characterized by abnormal gyri. So the list encephaly actually means smooth brain. And the reason um, that this, this disorder is called that is because the brain either totally lacks gyri, so that would be a gyria, or has very broad or thickened gyri, which is pachygyria, which results in a smooth appearance to the surface of the brain. Now, clinically, patients with type 1 encephaly will have severe mental retardation, hypotonia, and seizures. And there's several different genetic types, um, some of which we will be discussing today. But just to show you an example of what a brain with type 1 list encephaly looks like, um, here we are. Now, those of you that are familiar with fetal autopsies know that there are certain points in development where a smooth brain is actually the normal finding. Um, but this is a brain um, that was from uh, an infant, um, a term infant. And so at that point, you should have a pretty mature appearing um, gyral and uh, convolutional pattern. Um, the brain which should definitely not be smooth. And so here we see a total absence of gyri. So this is a gyria. We just have the sylvian fissure present here. And here's another example of a brain with a gyria where completely lacking gyri and sulci. In these brains with type 1 list encephaly, if you look at a coronal section, again, we can appreciate the lack of gyri and sulci here, but you can also appreciate just how thickened and abnormal the cortex appears as well. So here are some of the various uh, genetic types or different types of um, type 1 list encephaly. They have uh, various modes of inheritance. Autosomal recessive form is due to mutations in realin. These patients often will have um, cerebellar um, abnormalities as well. There are two different forms of autosomally dominant inherited uh, type 1 list encephaly. They are both due to mutations in the list 1 gene. And then there are the X-linked forms. So X-linked dominant, type 1 list encephaly is due to double cord mutations, and X-linked recessive is due to mutations in ARX. And we'll go through um, examples of these as well. Before we get to that, um, I think it can be difficult sometimes to appreciate sort of even normal cortical lamination using routine histologic stains. Um, and so this is a nice schematic, which sort of gives you an idea of what these various types of lysencephaly um, look like. 
so over here on the left, we have the normal cortex, um, uh, neocortex, which of course has six layers. Layer one is very hypocellular. Layers two and four have smaller granule neurons. Layers three and five have preamble cells, with layer five having the big preamble cells. And layer six also has larger cells, like these fusiform cells. It contains preamble cells too. Um, so this is obviously a simplification, but just gives some idea of the normal cortex and the amount of underlying white matter you'd expect. Now, when we start talking about these various types of lysencephaly, um, you get some attempt at lamination of the cortex. So it's in layers, but the layers are normal. So if um, in lysencephaly that's due to LIS1 deletions, um, you get a four layer cortex and we can see that you know the neurons are totally misaligned. Um, the large preamble cells are up here in layer two, layer four is this mumble jumble, it's very thick. And again, the cortex itself is very thickened here. Uh, mutations in double cortin also cause a four layer lysencephaly. The difference between the double cortin um, mutations and those with the LIS1 um, deletions is that um, in the setting of a LIS1 deletion, the more severe um, cortical abnormalities are seen in the posterior aspects of the brain. Whereas with double cortin mutations, you'd expect the more severe changes to um, be observed in the anterior portions of the brain. Um, in lysencephaly that's due to ARX mutations, you actually get a three layer cortex. Layer one's very hypercellular. Layer three is very, very large here. And you can see a very small amount of underlying white matter. And this one also has a posterior predominance. Now, this is just an example of normal uh, cortex, um, hexalaminar cortex. And again, I think it can be a little bit difficult to pick out exactly, say, where layer two ends and layer three begins, but you can get an appreciation of the overall organization here. Again, layer one being hypocellular, you can kind of pick out layer two here, layer five's got the larger bramble cells. So um, we'll be seeing some deviations from, from that in the subsequent slides. So let's start by talking about the autosomal dominant forms um, of type 1 lysencephaly. The first one is called isolated lysencephaly, and it's due to mutations of the LIS1 gene. Again, autosomal dominant inheritance. So LIS1 encodes the non-catalytic subunit of platelet activating factor acetyl hydrolase. This is important in the regulatory pathway for dynin, dynin being a microtubule associated protein, and it's important for neuronal migration. So again, type 1 lysencephaly is an, um, a disorder of neuronal migration. And once again, this causes a four layer cortex that has more severe um, abnormalities in the more posterior aspects of the brain. Now related to isolated lysencephaly is Miller-Deeker syndrome. So the clinical features of this syndrome include microcephaly by temporal narrowing, vertical ridging of the forehead and a small jaw, micronathia. And you can also see abnormalities of other organs as well, including heart and kidney anomalies and cryptorganism. So like isolated lysencephaly, um, you have uh, deletions of the LIS1 gene in Miller-Deeker syndrome. But in addition to that, you have deletions of other genes on the short arm of chromosome 17. And specifically, this 1433 gene is thought to be quite important. So the lysencephaly is due to the deletion of LIS1. And all the other uh, facial features that you get in the syndrome are, the deletion, are due to um, the deletion of other genes on the short arm of chromosome 17. So here's an example of a brain uh, with Miller-Deeker syndrome. Again, here we can appreciate the very smooth appearance here. We're looking down from the vertex. So now we do we do have left and right hemispheres this time, but we're totally lacking um, gyri and sulci here. So we have agyria. And cut sections again show just how abnormally thickened the cortex is here. And here's a histologic section, again, just showing that very thickened cortex. Now, talking about the um, X-linked um, forms of type 1 lysencephaly, beginning with uh, double cortin. So double cortin is located on chromosome XQ22. Again, the inheritance here is X-linked dominant. In males, double cortin causes isolated lysencephaly. It causes um, a different phenotype in females, as we'll see in a subsequent slide. And again, this is a four layer lysencephaly that, has more severe, um, uh, that is more severe in the anterior aspects of the brain. So the other type of um, X-linked lysencephaly is called X-lag, which stands for X-linked lysencephaly with ambiguous genitalia. It's due to mutations in the ARX gene. And again, this is X-linked recessive inheritance. In this syndrome, you can see agenesis of the corpus callosum. Patients will have um, very severe seizures and issues with temperature regulation and microcephaly. This causes a three-layer 
plus encephaly that's more severe in the posterior portions of the brain. And here's a histologic um, section of a brain uh, from a patient that had an X-lag. So again, we have a three-layer lysencephaly here. The cortex is very, very thick. Um, if you recall from the schematic, layer one is very hypercellular. Layer two has sort of these medium-sized cells, and layer three is very thick and contains a total mumble-jumble um, of all different cell types. So those were our types of type one lysencephaly going to transition now to talking about type 2 lysencephaly and try and compare and contrast it from type 1. Type 2 lysencephaly is sometimes referred to as cobblestone lysencephaly, and we'll see why. So unlike type 1 lysencephaly, where we had all those different modes of inheritance, um, all the types of type 2 lysencephaly I'll be discussing have autosomal recessive inheritance. Whereas in type 1 lysencephaly, there was some attempt at forming layers in the cortex, um, even though they were certainly abnormal. In type 2 lysencephaly, the cortex is totally disorganized. There's no attempt at any sort of lamination. And, um, and we'll see why um, you get thickened meninges in, in just a moment. The other thing that's unique about type 2 lysencephaly is that there's this very strong association with muscle and eye abnormalities as well. So here is a brain um, from type two lysencephaly. So again, here we're sort of appreciating the fact that it's a smooth brain, lysencephaly, um, because we don't uh, really up here have any real gyri or sulci. Maybe we have some packy gyria back here, a thickened gyrus perhaps, but overall the brain looks very smooth. However, it doesn't look like the type one lysencephaly brains because the meninges here appear very thickened and we can almost appreciate this like lumpy, bumpy cobblestone appearance to the surface of the brain due to that thickening of the meninges. So here's a coronal section, again, showing just the smooth surface of the brain here without gyri and sulci and the abnormal appearing cortex. And here's a histologic section of cortex. And here we can appreciate no attempt at sort of any lamination. It's just sort of a scrambled mess of neurons. Another thing is that the surface of the brain would normally end around here, but we have all these neurons that have migrated out into the meninges and sort of obliterated the subarachnoid space, which is what gives you that cobblestone appearance, the thickened meninges, and why this is called cobblestone encephaly. So here are some of the various um, types of type 2 encephaly. There's Fukuyama congenital muscular dystrophy, um, most commonly seen in Japan due to mutations of FC and D. There's the various muscle eye brain diseases, uh, which can be due to mutations in FKRP, POM, GNT1, and large. And then there's Walker Warburg syndrome, which is associated with mutations of POM T1 and POM T2. Now, this is certainly not an exhaustive list of genes. Um, the thing that sort of ties all this together is that these genes are um, encode glycosyl transferases, um, which, if you get mutations, results in hypoglycosylation of alpha dystroglycan and a secondary reduction of lamina and alpha 2. Now, in muscle, we know that alpha dystroglycan glycan is very important. It links um, actin to the extracellular matrix and maintains um, the sarcolemma. Now, obviously, if you know there's abnormalities in that, that would explain why we have um, muscle disease in a lot of these um, um, instances. And in the brain, um, alpha dystroglycan is very important for maintaining the glial peel limitans. So that was thought to be maybe why these neurons are over-migrating. Um, the glial peel limitans is abnormal, and so the neurons do not stop where they're supposed to, and they end all the way up um, in the meninges. So type 2 lysencephaly is a disorder of neuronal migration in the sense that it is um, a failure to arrest um, uh, migration where um, where uh, the neuron should stop migrating. So let's talk about a few of the different types. Um, first is walker warburg syndrome. It's sometimes referred to as hard plus E syndrome, which stands for hydrocephalus, agyria, so that's your lysencephaly, retinal dysplasia, and encephalocele. Um, also referred to sometimes as cerebroocular dysplasia muscular dystrophy syndrome. So again, you get a cobblestone lysencephaly, you have cerebellar dysplasias with vermal agenesis, hydrocephaly, occipital encephalocele, which isn't present in all cases, um, and muscular dystrophy, and a variety of ocular abnormalities. These um, uh, patients will die in infancy. And again, there's an association with mutations in POM T1 and POM T2. And then related to this are the various muscle eye brain diseases, uh, which present with generalized muscle weakness, contractions, seizures, eye anomalies, and again, type 2 lysencephaly. And there's been a variety of genes um, which are um, associated with the muscle eye brain diseases as well.
So here's an example of a brain um, of a patient with Walker-Warburg syndrome. Again, here, the brain is smooth in the sense that we have a gyria here, but the meninges appear thickened and there's sort of this cobblestone appearance to the surface of the brain. So here we've got a nice normal comparison. So here's a normal coronal section here in contrast to the Walker-Warburg um, example down here, again, showing no gyri and sulci and an abnormal appearing cortex. As I mentioned, you also get cerebellar um, abnormalities in these um, Walker-Warburg um, cases. So here we have the hindbrain. We've cut it longitudinally. So we've got the pons, fourth ventricle, and then the cerebellar hemispheres and the vermis in the middle. And here on the Walker-Warburg example, we can see there's really no normal um, architecture here to the cerebellar folia, and we're missing the vermis. And this can be seen histologically as well. So here's um, a section from cortex, again, just showing that mumble jumble scramble of neurons uh, in the cortex, no attempt at um, any sort of lamination and the neurons have migrated all the way out here um, into the subarachnoid space. So this is again, over migration disorder. And then here's a microscopic section um, from the cerebellum, once again, showing no normal folial architecture and um, absence of the vermis here. So that was our type one and type two lysencephalies. We're going to transition now to talking about um, heterotopias. So what is a gray matter heterotopia? Well, it's a cluster of neurons and glia that are forming a region of gray matter where it's not supposed to be. So once again, there's a broad phenotypic spectrum here. You can have a single heterotopia. You can have multiple in one brain. They can line the ventricles, be in the deep white matter, the subcortical white matter, or even out in the leptomeninges. Now, depending on how extensive a heterotopia is, the cortex that overlies one might be totally normal or it may appear disrupted. And again, sort of depending on how extensive the heterotopias are, patients can have um, total normal um, neurologic exams, normal um, intelligence, and a heterotopia be detected incidentally either on imaging or at the time of autopsy. So I'm going to be focusing on, on two sort of subgroups of heterotopias today. Um, and fortunately their names are very self-explanatory. Nodular heterotopias are where you get nodules of heterotopic gray matter. Um, and the first examples I'm showing here are going to be some sort of um, periventricular um, nodular heterotopias. So this is an MRI, um, the transverse plane here. Um, this is T1 weighted. So the cortex, uh, the gray matter here appears darker than the underlying white matter. And as we sort of move toward the ventricles, we encounter more gray matter down here, all this lumpy, bumpy gray matter um, seen here, both on the right and the left. And this is a whole bunch of heterotopic gray matter. Now, if you actually look at one of these brains on autopsy, sometimes these little heterotopias actually sort of protrude into uh, the ventricle as shown here. And this is another um, autopsy brain here, also sort of cut um, transverse plane. Um, it doesn't have bilateral heterotopias here this time, we just have them on the left. But once again, we can appreciate this heterotopic gray matter here that's sort of bulging into the left lateral ventricle. And there's also some here as well in the uh, subcortical white matter. Now, histologically, these look just like what you'd expect. Um, gray matter, a nodule of gray matter where it's not supposed to be. On um, this stain, the white matter is, is, uh, appears sort of purpley and the gray matter, this more pinky color. So we have all these nodules of gray matter situated here in the white matter where, it's not, where they're not supposed to be. Now, as for the actual organization of these heterotopias, um, sometimes they're completely disorganized. Sometimes they try and actually form layers. Um, that doesn't really matter, you know, the, the actual organization of them so much as that, again, it's a nodule of gray matter in a abnormal location. And here's some of these periventricular ones. Um, we have these little nodules here of neurons that are sort of bulging into the lateral ventricle. Now, there are a variety of etiologies associated with nodular heterotopias. They've been reported following um, maternal hyperthermia, methylmercury poisoning, and radiation. There are some familial forms, too. Uh, one is sub familial subependymal heterotopia. This is seen predominantly in females. Um, it's thought to be lethal in males and have an excellent dominant inheritance. These have a pretty strong association with epilepsy and are due to mutations in filament 1. And this is an actin binding protein that's associated with the cytoskeleton and is very important for cell migration. So again, these heterotopias are due to abnormalities in neuronal migration. There's also a syndrome it's called periventricular nodular heterotopias with microcephaly due to mutations in ARFGEF2, which has autosomal recessive inheritance. Now, the other type of heterotopia I'm going to be speaking on is called band or sometimes laminar heterotopia. And again, the name tells you what it is. It's a heterotopic 
band. Um, so you have these bands of gray matter that are sort of situated in the subcortical white matter bilaterally, and I will show you examples of these. Now the cortex that overlies one of these band heterotopias can be normal or it might have a simplified gyral pattern. Um, patients with uh, these band heterotopias tend to have some clinical um, symptoms, um, mild to moderate mental retardation, and there's an association with seizures that tend to present um, maybe towards like early adulthood. So here's another MRI. Um, we're switching things up here now. We're looking at a T2-weighted one. So this time the gray matter appears lighter and the underlying white matter appears dark. But again, we can appreciate if you look at cortical gray matter up here and then the white matter, we have these bands of uh, gray matter that are present here in the white matter. And this is a beautiful um, example from an autopsy of the same thing. Here's these bands, these bilateral bands of heterotopic gray matter and a nice um, histologic section showing the same thing. Here's your heterotopia right here, this, this long band. So band heterotopias are rare, um, or sorry, uh, this, this is it's kind of a rare condition. Um, it's not lethal, it's uh, associated with epilepsy, as I said, and this is predominantly seen in females. Now, band heterotopias are associated with double cortin mutations. And if you'll recall, we talked about double cortin when we were discussing type 1 lysencephaly. It caused an isolated lysencephaly in males. Now, this is sort of interesting. So it's thought, you know, for uh, males, you know, double cortin is located on the X chromosome. They have one copy of the X chromosome. So all of their neurons will have the mutant double cortin, and they all, fa they all do fail to migrate properly. Now for females, there's two copies of the X chromosome, one that would have the mutant double cortin and one that has the wild type allele. And due to um, X inactivation mosaicism, um, the neurons that are expressing the sort of wild type double cortin allele would go and migrate properly and form the normal cortex. And then the neurons that are expressing the mutant double cortin allele fail to migrate properly and form the band heterotopias in females. And so it's really interesting how uh, mutations in this one gene can produce two different phenotypes. So let's um, wrap up our malformations of cortical development by talking about cortical dysplasias with cytomegaly. Um, today I'll be talking about focal cortical dysplasias and tuberous sclerosis. Um, hemimegalencephaly could fit in here, um, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to focus on these two. And the underlying theme of this section will be mTOR pathway. So there's a variety of um, ways that people have proposed to kind of classify focal cortical dysplasias. Um, the one I'm going to be using um, for this talk is the International League Against Epilepsy classification system, which breaks them down into types one, two, and three. Type one has to do with abnormal um, lamination. Um, we won't be discussing that today. Type three is where you have a focal cortical dysplasia in association with another lesion. So not focusing on that, we're going to be zeroing in on these type two focal cortical dysplasias. And there are two type two focal cortical dysplasias. There's type two A and type two B. Both contain dysmorphic neurons. The difference between the two is that type 2B also contains balloon cells. And so for once, um, we have a classification system that's actually helpful for remembering things. So B, balloon cells, B and B. I think that's actually, that's, that's nice. So here we're looking for the first time in this talk at an actual surgical specimen, not an autopsy specimen. So focal cortical dysplasias are associated with epilepsy. And so a neurosurgeon may go in to resect a seizure focus and you can see something that looks like this. So here, um, if you look at the cortex, we have um, a fairly good distinction here between the gray and the underlying white matter here. But as we follow the cortical ribbon around, we can see this area of like blurring. We can't really figure out where the gray matter ends, white matter begins. Um, if the tissue is very gliotic, this might feel very firm um, to the touch. And this is um, a surgical specimen that had focal cortical dysplasia. Now, microscopically, um, we'll start by talking about type 2 afocal cortical dysplasia. That's the one that has dysmorphic neurons only. So what are dysmorphic neurons? Well, they can take on a variety of appearances. Um, they tend to be very large. So here I have an example. Um, these images were taken from the same brain. This is an area that had normal appearing cortex. These are layer five neurons, so some of the biggest neurons in cortex. Um, taken at the same magnification, here are the dysmorphic neurons. You can see just how big these are compared to the more normal ones. So very large. Um, they often have a big cell body, a big nucleus. They are mal-oriented. They're abnormally distributed. Um, they're clumped. Um, 
they have this uh, abnormal missile substance that's kind of clumpy here. They can have irregularly thickened um, nuclear membranes. Um, sometimes you see cytoplasmic vacuolization, as we can see here. Um, this is more of a normal for comparison to just see how big this guy is. Here's a couple of the kissing neurons. Um, so again, these can take on a variety of forms. But, uh, these are examples of dysmorphic neurons, and that is what you see in type 2A focal cortical dysplasia. Now in type 2B focal cortical dysplasia, you will also have dysmorphic neurons. Here's a few more examples of these very, very big neurons here. Um, the, this guy has sort of an abnormally thickened nuclear membrane here, clumpy missile substance. But in addition to the dysmorphic neurons, you also have balloon cells. So here's an example of a balloon cell, and there's a few more over here on the right. So balloon cells have this very large amount of glassy eosinophilic cytoplasm with eccentrically no located nuclei that kind of shoved off to the side. Sometimes these guys are binucleated. Um, and they're very interesting because if you stain them, um, they'll stain for both neuronal and glial markers. So like neurofilament and GFAP can stain these, indicating sort of a mixed phenotype. And ultrastructural studies have also um, supported that mixed phenotype. So this is sort of an interesting um, example of um, abnormal um, differentiation in these cells. And these focal cortical dysplasias are associated um, with somatic uh, mutations in the mTOR pathway. So let's um, talk about tuberous sclerosis now. So as we know, this um, can cause abnormalities in a variety of organs and even within the brain. You know, there can get things like subependable giant blastocytomas. Today, we're going to be talking just about the cortical tubers. Um, so here's an example of a tuber. Um, if you see one on the surface, uh, the surface of the brain, it looks sort of like a very widened or um, thickened gyrus here. It can be very, very firm to the touch. And like type uh, or like the focal cortical dysplasias, um, if you see them sort of in a surgical specimen or even on autopsy, you get this blurring of the gray white matter junction and this setting of this very thickened um, gyrus. And microscopically, they actually look a lot like type 2B focal cortical dysplasia. You can get abnormally large neurons, you can get abnormally uh, abnormal appearing astrocytes, and then you also have these cells, balloon cells that have that mixed phenotype that's sort of in between neurons and, and glia. Now, we do know the etiology of tuberous sclerosis. Again, it's either due to mutations of TSC1 or TSC2. Now, these genes are important because they're upstream of the mTOR pathway and actually would normally inhibit this pathway. So if you get a mutation, you get a loss of inhibition and hyperactivation of mTOR and then uncontrolled cell growth. And so that's what's thought to cause this sort of cytomegaly that you might see um, in these conditions. All right, so I think now it's time for the virtual slides. I'm going to stop sharing for just one second so I can switch over to Path Presenter. Let's see works. All right, so let's do some of the virtual slides. So starting with our first case here, um, we're looking at a sagittal um, view of the brain. Um, this would be the lateral ventricle here, and we're missing the corpus callosum. And if we weren't certain about our gross diagnosis, you know, maybe the corpus callosum just got torn. To support that, our, our um, assessment, we can also see here that we have this abnormal radiating gyral pattern that's coming off here. So this is an example of total agenesis um, of the corpus callosum. Oops, okay. So let me rotate this real quick. Get up some microscopic sections here. So um, this would be sort of um, the medial um, aspect um, or sort of along the surface of the interhemispheric fissure, sort of coming down here. This is where the cingulate gyrus would be normally. and down here is where we would normally get the corpus callosum, but you can see it's absent. Instead, we have this bundle over here um, of white matter, and to sort of support that that's what's going on here. Here's the same section stained with luxal fast blue. So again, here following cortex around, and the corpus callosum should be coming out here, but we can see that it's not. Instead here, we have this myelinated region of white matter, and the axons here are running in and out of the plane uh, that we're looking at here. So this is that props bundle um, that I mentioned before. Once again, this is um, supposed to, or is thought to represent um, in some cases, uh, misdirected colossal fibers. So that's an example of total agenesis of the corpus callosum. 
Now let's look, start looking at a, um, a fetal brain now. So here we are looking at the anterior um, aspects of the brain here. This would be the frontal lobes. And while we might be able to sort of appreciate what looks to be a shallow interhemispheric fissure here, we can see here in the most anterior aspect of the brain that there is um, a total fusion here. There's really no separation into the left and right halves. And if you look at this brain on the coronal section here at the level of the basal ganglia, you can kind of follow the cortex around and we can see here that it dips down, but there's an incomplete separation here. Rotate this. So this is that same section shown microscopically. So again, we're looking at a fetal brain here. So we have the ganglionic eminences here, and here's the cortical plate. And as we follow around the cortical plate here, it sort of dips down, but it continues across the midline. There's no complete separation here, separation here into left and right. So this is an example of holoprosencephaly. Um, in this brain, um, even though I didn't there wasn't shown on the, the gross image there, there was some separation in the more posterior aspects of the brain with the fusion occurring in the more anterior portions. So this would be consistent with the sort of semi-lobar form of holoprosencephaly. Now here's another example from a fetal autopsy here. Um, we can appreciate these um, nasal abnormalities as well as the uh, cleft lip and palate here. Now the spring was, was very fragile. So here we are looking at um, sort of the frontal aspect of the brain was cut off and, and placed in water. And we're looking down at that. And here we can see that, again that there's no separation into left and right hemispheres. We have a holosphere here with a monoventricle. And I know they're probably hard to appreciate, but you might be able to pick out these little nodules here that looks like they're protruding into the ventricle. So here's a microscopic section of that. Again, we're looking at the holosphere here. There's no separation into left and right hemispheres. We have our monoventricle. And in addition, we have these little nodules down here of neurons, heterotopic neurons, sort of in the periventricular location. And this is nicely highlighted by a new end stain here. So again, here's the cortex. And then here, the new end stain is highlighting these heterotopic neurons, which are present here along the ventricular surface. So this was an example of, um, of uh, alobar holoprosencephaly with these periventricular nodular heterotopias. So here's another brain. This was um, from an infant. And well, at that point, once again, the brain should have um, sort of a, a very uh, mature appearing uh, uh, gyral and sulcal pattern, but this brain here is really lacking anything like that. We have a smooth brain here, a gyria. This is viewed from the side, and here we're looking down at the top. Um, and even though the brain appears smooth, we can see that the meninges are thickened and we have this sort of lumpy, bumpy cobblestone look to the surface of the brain. Coronal sections demonstrated again that age area and this abnormal appearance to the cortex. And when we examine the hindbrain here, we're looking at the posterior aspect of the cerebellum. So the hemispheres are being um, sort of opened up here, pushed aside. We're missing the vermis and we're looking into the fourth ventricle here. And you can even see that the, the hemispheres themselves um, do not appear grossly normal. So let's look at some microscopic sections, starting with the cortex. Um, we'll start with H neve. I think it might be even easier to appreciate on um, the new end stain, which I'll show you next. But here's cortex, and really there's no hint at any sort of usual cortical lamination. Um, everything's sort of a jumbled mess. And if we look out here toward the very surface, we can see that we even have um, neurons that have made it all the way out here into what we suspect is probably the subarachnoid space, or what would have been the subarachnoid space. <laughs> So here's a nice new end stain, sort of showing the same thing. So if we go down and look at that same area of cortex here, again, really no sense of any kind of attempts at um, forming layers here. The neurons are sort of a um, just mumble jumbled. And then we have, again, all these neurons which have made it all the way out here into what is presumably the leptomeninges. And to support that, here is a reticulin stain going back to that same area. 
So this region out here where we saw all those neurons, um, again, this would be what would have been the subarachnoid space, but has been obliterated by all these neurons that have over-migrated. So this was an example of a type 2 lysencephaly, cobblestone lysencephaly, specifically Walker-Warburg syndrome. Oh, and I almost forgot, here's a section of the cerebellum. As we saw, there was no vermis. Um, the hemispheres appeared abnormal. We don't really see any normal foliar architecture um, here. You know, if you go down here, it's it's sort of very hard to make heads and tails. We do have some Purkinje uh, or um, neurons and some granule cells, but they're really not forming any kind of normal foliar architecture here. So those are the cerebellar abnormalities that go along with Walker-Warburg syndrome. <laughs> So our final um, specimen that we're going to be looking at is a surgical specimen here, um, resected in a patient that had seizures. So here we have some distinction between the gray matter and underlying white matter. But in other regions, it becomes a little bit harder to kind of make heads and tails of, of where the cortical gray matter and subcortical white matter, like where the border would be. So this is a histologic section which should contain um, cortex, uh, the cortical gray matter and underlying white matter, but it's really hard to kind of see, again, where does one end and the other begin? Now, for the sake of time, we'll just zoom in real quickly here to these very large neurons. Maybe this is a more normal sized one over here. We can see how big they are. They have this really weird missile substance. that's all clumpy, irregularly thick in nuclear membranes. So these are um, dysmorphic neurons. And in addition to the dysmorphic neurons, if we start looking around, we can see all these cells that have sort of glassy eosinophilic cytoplasm, eccentrically located nuclei. Some of them are binucleated. So these are our balloon cells. Um, so this was an example of focal cortical dysplasia type 2b because it has both dysmorphic neurons and these balloon cells. So, um, that uh, we've covered quite a bit today. Um, we started by talking about the disorders of forebrain induction, which includes the three different types of holoprosencephaly and agenesis of the corpus callosum. And then we discussed various malformations of cortical development, including type one and type two lysencephaly, um, both nodular and band heterotopias. And then we wrapped up with the cortical dysplasia with cytomegaly. So I thank you all so very much for your attention today and I'm happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you so much, Angela. That was that was really very nice and illustrative. Um, there are a couple of questions that have already been submitted, so I'll go ahead and read those first. Uh, but if anybody else has questions, please go ahead. Um, the first question is about nomenclature. Uh, it says, um, when discussing holoprosencephaly, might it not be better to avoid using the term fusion and instead refer to failure of separation? Yes, that is true. Thank you. That's a very good point because that is essentially what it is. Um, sometimes it's described and see, I even caught myself doing it too. You can find it in, in textbooks and even papers described that way as, you know, because it appears fused, but you're absolutely right. The, it's actually a failure of separation as opposed to two things that were separated that became fused. So that is a very good point. Thank you. All right. And the second question that says, great talk. Thank you. Can you comment on the fixation of postmortem fetal brains? Only formalin, booins, alcohol? Yes, so we, we just do formalin here. Um, it's a pretty high concentration, um, but it's it's true that sometimes even after many, many weeks, uh, they, they don't get fixed the same way that um, adult brains or brains from, from older children do. We um, Booins was used in the past, but obviously due to various safety concerns with that, we, we've we just been using formalin and uh, using it at high concentrations. And for the most part, as long as the brains aren't too autolyzed or macerated, uh, we tend to get pretty good results with that. All right. Um, there's another question coming up now in the chat. It says, clinically, is there any relation to maternal age parents with psychiatric diseases? I guess it's in general to any of the topics you discussed. Hmm. So not that off the top of my head, that's a very good question. You know, there might be, you know, certain medications that somebody could potentially be on um, for a psychiatric um, condition, which are known teratogens, which can cause these. Um, so in that respect, potentially, um, maternal age, I'm not as aware of that having a really strong association with one of these. All right, another one. Um, how would you approach signing out a large surgical specimen, nearly an entire lobe, 
with marked type 2B cortical dysplasia. Is that too diffuse and could be something more approaching hemimegalencephaly? Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, and it, it might be, you know, because sometimes, you know, hemimegalencephaly isn't necessarily the entire hemisphere, right? It's, it's sort of a question of where do you draw the line for a focal cortical dysplasia being focal versus hemimegalencephaly? I think if it's pretty widespread, um, then it probably, you could probably invoke something like hemimegalencephaly. Um, again, sort of the underlying um, genetics, uh, they're both associated with M4 alterations. And so they're probably just, I've heard it proposed that it's probably again, sort of a phenotypic spectrum of just how extensive um, those somatic mutations are, like how much of the brain the somatic mutation is involving. And so since they are probably a spectrum, I think if, you know, if, if enough of, of the brain is involved, then hemimegalencephaly might be the appropriate diagnosis. So I guess that kind of answers another question that says, can you mention briefly how hemimegalencephaly fits into this classification? Yeah, of course. So it falls under the cortical dysplasias with cytomegalies. Um, and as I said, there's associations there with the mTOR pathway as well. You get abnormally, the cortex you know, appears abnormally thickened. You get a large neurons, large astrocytes. Um, and again, it's thought to have be due to somatic mutations in the mTOR. Um, and so it's probably again, sort of on the spectrum of the cortical dysplasia. Another one question, uh, is there a good explanation for why some of the migration, migrational disorders affect certain restricted brain regions? Hmm, that's a really great question. I have to admit, I do not know the answer to that. Um, all right, I am not seeing any more questions, but one of the things is like, so, you know, you're describing the um, uh, focal cortical, dis or cortical dysplasias with cytomegaly. Um, and it, it came to mind that if you, if you were only to be uh, given, you know, a very restricted field, you really would not be able to differentiate something like, you know, type two focal cortical dysplasia from like a tuber and tuber sclerosis. Is that true? It's true. Sometimes, um, you know, I've, I've seen cases where um, the initial presentation of tuber sclerosis actually was a, uh, you know, what ended up being a signed out as a type two B focal cortical dysplasia, but as they work the, the patient up more, um, ended up you know, deciding that the diagnosis would be more appropriate. Um, you know, the patient had tuber sclerosis, so it'd be a cortical tuber, but ultimately um, they look so similar um, microscopically that you know, trying to just tell them apart, like you, know, like you said, um, I wouldn't be one who would, who would venture to do that without like a really great clinical history that you know, points you towards tuber sclerosis. I think microscopically type 2B um, focal cortical dysplasia and the cortical tubers really have such phenotypic overlap or um, um, morphologic overlap. All right. Um, there are two more questions. Uh, <laughs> although one, I guess we haven't really uh, touched upon today. It says, if you only see hypercellular layer one, what do you call it? Uh, so the term <laughs> microdysgenesis has been invoked. Um, and so I think, you know, I tend to be descriptive with things like that and just sort of uh, sign out a descriptive diagnosis saying that and then the comments say this could potentially represent um, something that's been referred to sometimes in the literature as microdysgenesis. All right. And how often do you see uh, type 2B focal cortical dysplasia outside of the uh, uh, tuber sclerosis complex? So we see it actually pretty frequently here, although I might have a bit of a skewed perspective because um, we have a pediatric neurosurgeon here who specializes in epilepsy. Um, and so we, we get a lot of cases um, sort of referred to us, but um, I would say I maybe get resections from a tuber sclerosis patients maybe once or twice a year, but we get on the maybe 20 um, focal cortical dysplasia type 2B outside of the setting of tuber sclerosis a year. So at least in the practice here, um, it's actually much more common to just see sort of an isolated type 2B focal cortical dysplasia. Um, and again, I, I guess to, to go back to the question about the different restricted brain regions, do you know if there's any particular areas that are more prone to have uh, somatic mutations, as you've mentioned before, or is it just the, like a stochastic thing? Yeah, that's a great question about the focal cortical dysplasias. I mean, we tend to see them more in the um, sort of in the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes. I'm not sure if that's, if my personal experience matches up completely with the literature um, on that. Uh, and I'm not sure if there's any you know, great reason um, for that either, but that's been my personal experience is that a lot of um, the resections that we get tend to come from the frontal lobes or the temporal lobes. Okay. 
All right. Well, um, I see no further questions. Thank you so much, Angela. This has been a really exceptional talk. Um, and um, thank you, everybody, for attending as well. Okay. Thank you all. All right. Thank you, everyone, again, for joining today's ANP Teaching Rounds presentation. We would ask that you take a few minutes to complete a short evaluat evaluation, which will be entered into the chat box momentarily. Completion helps ensure accurate reporting to the accreditation board. It may not display as a link, so please copy and paste it into your web browser if needed. The PowerPoint slides and recording will be posted to the AANP website in the next week. Thank you again to Dr. Vianney for an excellent presentation, and this concludes our session for today.